Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And I've done a number of videos uh, trying to give you a mishmash of some of the talks um, that I attended at the AGU American Geophysical Union 2017 conference in New Orleans. And uh, I'll talk about some of the panel sessions that I went to, very interesting sessions or on the last day and then kind of give an overview of, of the whole conference, if that's possible. Um, this uh, video series, you know, the last number of videos, is kind of an experiment to see whether, you know, I'm still not sure if this is the best way or useful or you like, so, like it, so, you know, comments uh, would be appreciated. But, so, the afternoon on the Friday, um, last day of the conference, is it time for climate intervention? There was a panel from 140 to 340, and uh, David Keith was supposed to be at the panel, um, but he uh, couldn't make it. Um, and uh, but there were a lot of big names there in the um, G slash quote geoengineering carbon dioxide slash which I say you know carbon dioxide removal solar radiation management ideas so Ben van der Plusion, Plusion, University of Michigan and Arbor talked about the moral hazard uh, you know he gave a little introduction and talked about you know how is it moral not to actually study and research whether it will actually be possible to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere whether it will actually be possible to reverse climate change and cool the planet so he talked about research being necessary um, but kind of being you know just he was pushing basically the idea that research uh, was necessary to see whether these things were even could be on the table at some point in the future Janos Pazter, Carnegie with the with C2G2, which is Carnegie Climate, that's the C2, Carnegie, Carnegie Climate, Geoengineering Governance, that's the G2 initiative. So they set up an initiative to look at the, um, you know, how would we govern such a thing? If we were actually cooling the planet, who would control the level, who would control the location? Who would, con who would monitor the effects and see whether it was doing the right thing. You know, how do we ever govern such, such a thing? Um, you know, carbon dioxide removal is a bit easier uh, to, to, to look at because we put the stuff up there. If we can take it out, then, then great. So it's a bit, uh, you know, it's not as um, controversial, if you like. Um, my criticism right away, and I brought this up, you know, I, 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 I don't know if this was recorded. I had some very, um, shall we say, heated, heated, I don't know, very, very um, assertive comments about, you know, look, guys, you're talking about moral hazards and risks and things already of, of carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management, but you're not talking about why we would need to do it like the risk of not doing it my I just said look the risk of not doing it is far far greater and getting far far bigger at an accelerating rate than the risk of, of, of doing it the risk of figuring it out and deploying it um, you know uh, the risk being complete uh, elimination of the biosphere on the earth for example how's that for an, a, a, an existential penultimate risk and they didn't really address that at all in, in this. And I, you know, uh, you gotta compare apples to ac apples. How can you talk about a risk being large unless you compare it to, a ri you know, a path A, a risk being large. How, do you, how can you say it's large if you don't even look at the risk of not doing path A? You can't, right? It's, it's ridiculous. Um, Anthony Jones um, talked about solar geoengineering and the modification of North Atlantic tropical cyclone frequency. Um, you know, these were some of the panelists. Um, Steve Desch, University of Arizona, gave a good talk on Arctic ice management. He's the one who uh, you might have seen in the news, the idea of using wind-powered water pumps to thicken ice, you know, having millions of these pumps in the Arctic to thicken ice. If you could thicken ice about a meter, 
above what it would normally grow to in the winter, then it would take, you know, you could start, you could actually restore the sea ice, you know, uh, the, lots of the sea ice and keep that uh, Arctic, uh, the albedo up because you've got dark uh, water covered by white sea ice. Thomas Ackerman from University of Washington gave a, gave a good, an excellent overview. I'd like to get a copy of his slides. Um, and uh, he, uh, I've talked to him in the past about marine cloud brightening, the idea of nozzles to, um, to make uh, fire seawater through high pressure nozzles so that the salt crystals are of a right size depending on the nozzle size to uh, gener act as cloud seeding mechanisms to make clouds. Basically in the Arctic there's lots of clouds. They're dark clouds because the water droplets are very large. So if you seed the atmosphere, these are low level marine clouds, one, one and a half kilometers high. So if you seed the atmosphere which contains the water vapor with these salt crystals of the correct size then you will get much much smaller particles and those particles will be very bright and reflect a lot of the sunlight. So that's the idea of marine cloud brightening. You're not creating the clouds, you're making sure the clouds that form, which are going to form anyway, are ones with small water particles, small water particles, which will be highly reflective, the Tuomi effect. So, so uh, anyway, he talked about um, lots of different ideas and things. Um, the uh, Basically, um, and there was discussion of this something called the NMOD treaty. I'm not sure what that's about, where every, every degree is, you know, every degree is, is, is worth fighting for, right? Um, there was, uh, yes, I don't, I don't have it here, but there was this other, there was this woman um, from Stanford, and let me get her name right. It's Leslie Field, and she's with the she was one of the panelists, Leslie Field, Stanford University, and it's uh, ICE 911 or something. Here it is. Leslie Field, uh, she had posters. She was on and, at the session. Um, Alan Roebuck was there in the audience. ICE911.org, that's Leslie Field's. Uh, she started this company years ago and she's got some students uh, that are working on some of the ideas and the idea is how do you make ice? How do you, how do you make ice to regrow the Arctic sea ice? Because she recognizes that losing it is gonna be uh, very hugely disruptive slash catastrophic. Uh, um, and uh, so, and uh, so in the question and answer, you know, like I said, it got pretty heated. Um, Alan Roebuck, um, is quite uh, well known um, in the climate field and has taken up to be completely and utterly and totally against uh, any form of geoengineering. He didn't specify really between CDR and SRM, although I think it's more against SRM, saying it was just, you know, ridiculous, it was a pipe dream, it should never be done and gave all of these, said he had 27 reasons as to why it shouldn't be done. I'll have to get that list from him and see, uh, you know, see if I can, uh, you know, uh, apply, apply the, uh, you know, put it through the, uh, the test and see, you know, and I, you know, so I've said, well, do you know how, like, I, th I said that we need to declare a global climate change emergency. Things are out of hand. Um, CO2 levels, uh, emissions are supposed to have been down and yet we're setting record high levels, methane's shooting up, you know, the Arctic is losing sea ice, we're going to a really bad place and uh, it, it's an emergency because that bad place is going to be full of climate disruption, extreme weather events, I mean we're only scratching the surface now. So I said if you look against that risk of doing nothing, we obviously have to study and do deploy these geoengineering techniques. Um, you know, I, we're losing the biosphere, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I went on and gave my spiel, and uh, anyway, he's like, who is this guy, he's wondering. It's, I don't think the session was taped, so unfortunately. And then after that, of course, uh, what session ended off the conference? But, you know, and it was a late session, it was four to six on Friday. It was the role of comedy in science. 
So how do you communicate science better? You know, make things, you know, what, how much can you use comedy um, to uh, get your message across? So Josh Willis, W-I-L-L-I-S, AKA the science guy, um, he uh, wants to be known as the, the funniest um, geoscientist. Right, so he's got a YouTube channel, um, and he actually took comedy seriously. He studied comedy for two years uh, with Second City, and he got a certificate, passed their course, and he tries to use comedy as much as he can to get messages out there. Um, there was a guy in the audience who was asking a lot of questions, and he kept quoting Oscar Wilde. So one of the things was, if you're going to tell people the truth, then make sure they will laugh or they will kill you. <laughs> okay? Um, there's uh, one of the guys, presenters, Cecil Penland, said, a spoonful of humor makes the math go down. Right? Like, like how do you, you know, if you have slides that are full of math and you're talking to a science audience, even though we're a world of specialists, most people will have no idea what the equations on your slide are. And it, slide are, and if you say, I'm really sorry for all the equations on the slide, you're actually disrespecting the audience. So how do you, you know, put things, how do you break down complicated equations into simple, uh, simpler things, put some humor in? Like humor is extremely disarming especially self-deprecating humor. So try this, if you're, talk, if you're being slammed by some climate denier and you put in some self-deprecating humor, you completely disarm them, you know? And this has happened to me over and over again. Um, and, uh, you know, they just, it just shuts, like, it's, it's the one thing that um, really stops them from always wanting to have the last word. I mean, they will have the last word anyway. You can never, you know, have the last word against these people. Um, Gavin Smith then talked, and this was the first time I'd seen him at the conference. Um, climate of Gavin, right? Real climate. He's associated with those things. Big name in climate science. This, um, doesn't think methane is a problem at all. If you remember some of the stuff from years ago, um, discussions and about methane um, coming up from the Arctic and things like that. Um, so he played, he'd put together a whole a sort of a mashup of all these different video clips. Um, so there was, uh, you know, Robert Mack um, in a TED talk and Kate Marvel, uh, you know, there's some whiskey thing. Joe Oliver and with you know his skit on there about 97% of science climate scientists think climate change is happening 3% don't let's have a debate so you have 97 people in white coats show up in a room and there's only three guys in three people you know that are the climate deniers and they have a debate you know on, on e even term equal terms you know as it should be you know instead of this media e equivalency thing Bill Nye was discussed in some of his techniques and there was some stuff in there with Bill Nye. Um, the word come on, Alan Harkin, um, this was interesting. There was Alan Harkin, um, there was some discussion about evangel evangelists, evangelists, you know, and Alan Harkin was gave, talking and said, you know, what if climate scientists are actually doing God's work, you know, in a talk, part of a talk to evangelists evangelist evangelist and there was like silence in the room you know what if asking you know questions that that really get at people's you know get them to think you know based on their value sets and stuff uh, mark twain it's easier to fool people than it is to convince them that they have been fooled right and then uh there was jolin l russell from the university of arizona gave a talk was talked about her work is on the Southern Ocean's role in climate. Very important area. You know, she talked about being on um, in, in the rough waters in the Southern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere takes up half of the CO2, um, how it absorbs so much of the heat. The ocean's a dog, atmosphere is a tail. And she talked about climate uh, humor. Thank you.